Uh, you're wondering why I, I'm looking so gruffy, why I didn't shave this week. You were wondering that, weren't you? I, I, I think so. Well, I, someone thought I was trying to look like a rock star, and, and that's not the case. Although I, uh, my world-famous band is playing at the dugout this Friday, uh, so you might want to come to that. Yeah, it's not quite world famous, but no, I, there's a, a person who is doing a, a, wrote this script, and it's going to be a Hollywood movie, and they asked me to play a role in it. And, and so I'm supposed to play a homeless person. Um, and uh, I can't, I'm sworn to secrecy, can't tell anything more about it than that. Uh, it's very strange, but uh, they, I have to go six weeks without shaving. So I'm going to be looking gruffier and gruffier and gruffier. I got I to just, you know, normally I had that GQ look going, and I'm just going to have to lose that. <laughs> Uh, I'll get it back afterwards, but so anyways, uh, that's how it goes. Shelly will put up with me. The, the not showering part for six weeks is going to be rough, but they, they really want me to be authentic. Yeah. <laughs> we are. More, 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 people will be sitting in the back more and more. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else I'm supposed to say? I think we can get into this now. Feels like I'm forgetting something. Can you believe that? I, uh, it's hard to... Okay, well, it will come to me later on. I think something I'm supposed to announce, but I can't remember what it was. So let's get, let's get into it. We're in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. I want to hover on those three verses a little bit more because there's something more to talk about there. I talked last week just about how Christ rescued us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. It was beautiful. And now we're going to find out how he did it. How he did it. So let's read these verses again. Oh, this is entitled Freedom, by the way. Freedom. Because it's about freedom. And we're talking about real freedom. I mean, there's political freedom, which is wonderful. But this is the freedom that Christ brings. And it's more wonderful. Infinitely more wonderful. Because this is the kind of freedom that can't be given to you by another person and it can't be taken from you. This is the kind of freedom that you can have whether you're living in a free country or a communist totalitarian state. It's the kind of freedom you can have if you're in prison or not in prison. You can be in the deepest, darkest cell. Locked up for life, but you can still have this freedom. This is the freedom that the Son gives us. And we'll, as we'll see here, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Yes, amen, amen. So Colossians chapter 1. Giving joyful thanks to the Father. And here's why we give thanks to the Father. Even if we have nothing else to be thankful for, we've got this and this dwarfs in significance, everything else. Giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you. Last week we saw that this means to empower, to give a capacity to. He's given us the capacity to share in the inheritance, beautiful inheritance, of his people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the do- dominion of darkness. That dominion word, exousia, we saw last week, means under the authority of something. He's rescued us from the authority of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption. In whom we have redemption. I'll talk about that today. The forgiveness of sins. Praise God. Pray with me here for a moment. Father, I thank you for every person here in this auditorium and every person who is listening through podcasts or television or or by whatever means. I thank you, Lord God, that you love them and you're involved in their life. And God, your grace is always working uh, to bring them closer to you. And Lord, we just pray right now in Jesus' name that you'd anoint this message in a powerful way. God, let freedom reign. God, give this word an authority that goes far beyond what any human words are capable of because it's authority to build the kingdom. Lord, use this message to build the kingdom, to to set the captives free, to remove whatever residual effects from the realm of darkness that we've been rescued from, remove it from our brains and from our hearts and help us to walk in the freedom that you've set us free to walk in. Only you can do that, Lord, by the power of your spirit, so let it be done. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Amen. Redemption. Talking about redemption. The word, apolutrosis, in Greek, means to procure by payment, to deliver by ransom. That's what the word redemption means. To procure by payment, to deliver by ransom. Uh, In the ancient Roman world, it was common to, not common, but it happened uh, at different times that people who were, who were slaves were, had, had someone else buy their freedom. That's apocalyptrosis. Uh, there's different classes of slaves in the ancient Roman world, but the lowest class were usually people who were, had their country conquered by Rome. Or There's a number of ways you could get into this class, but they, they were serving a life sentence. You could never get out of this kind of slavery. 
Higher, other forms, you could buy your own way out because you got paid a little bit and you could save up over years. But this one, you could not get out unless someone was willing to buy you and set you free. In parts of Rome, we know that they would take, in fact, this is a practice that's gone on throughout history. They would take these kind of slaves and bring them to the marketplace to sell them. Maybe an owner was short on cash and needed to, to, to sell a slave. And so they'd bring them down to the marketplace and put them up on a stage or a block, an auctioning table, and there they would auction them off. And people would come around, and if they're looking for a slave, they, they'd start the bidding. Um, and on occasion it would happen that somebody in the ancient world would, would buy the slave just for the purpose of setting them free. Apolutrosis. That's redemption. They would redeem the slave. In various ways, it's, uh, it's, it's, this has occurred throughout history. When, 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 uh, in the early years of America, they captured Africans and imported them over to the States. And as uh, soon as they got off the ship, they put them up on the block. And people would come from all around these plantation owners, and, and they'd start their bidding. These slaves, the ones who survived, because half of them didn't survive, millions died. Uh, in, in the process, it was, a, it was a tremendously barbaric voyage. But those who survived would get off the ship and be put up on a, a block, and, and, and the people would come and just start bidding for them. Uh, they, they would have been battered, many of them, because the abuse that took place on these ships was incredible. They would have been filthy and smelly, being locked down in the bottom part of the boat for the, the, the length of the voyage. They were in chains, and oftentimes they'd be stripped naked. If, if, if one of the auctioners wanted to see the merchandise more closely, they'd strip them naked in front of all these people, women and, and men. And that way the, the buyer could check out uh, whether this slave was going to be fit for the purposes that they intended to use them for. And they'd start their bidding. I'll give, I'll give 25 cents. I'll give 30. I'll give a dollar. I'll give a dollar 50, like, like cattle, just auctioning these folks off. And once in a while, it would happen, not frequently enough, but we, there are cases we know of where people would come and they would buy the slave. They would outbid everybody else in order to purchase the slave or the family, sometimes, to set them free, just to give them freedom. Apolutrosis, redemption. They would redeem the slave, redeem the families, because more often than not, the families just got split up. Kids from parents, husbands and wives, whoever bought you, that's where you went. But you'd buy this family, buy the slave, and set them free. Apolutrosis. This is what Jesus does for us. Apolutrosis. He redeems us. We saw last week that, that, that we were, and if you don't have Christ, you still are. In a domain of darkness, under the authority of the dark realm, in bondage to the principalities and powers, we were slaves. And we could not buy our way out. We were in bondage. The nature of the oppression of the forces is such that, that, that they deceive us. And so most people don't have any idea of how in bondage they are. They're not aware of the oppression of the spiritual realm. Most people don't even know the ways in which their own culture forms them and, and, and moves them and influences them and sometimes controls them. We're controlled. We're to a large degree slaves to the media and other things out there. But on the spiritual realm, all who are, lack Christ and have not been delivered are, are, are in this state of bondage, in the state of slavery. We could not buy our way out. There's nothing we could do to get out. In fact, the nature of the deception is such that we didn't want to get out. We were dead in sins. We could no more get out of this state of bondage and get free, then a corpse can run a marathon. It's not in the nature of a corpse to do anything, let alone run a marathon. Well, we could not get reconciled to God on our own. We wouldn't even want to be reconciled to God on our own. We're comfortable there. We think it's, 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 it's freedom. But in that state, in this bondage to our sin and to slavery, Jesus Christ looked upon us as though we were on the auctioning table and and, and he saw something there. He saw his own image. In the midst of all the filth, in the chains, he saw his own image. He saw something of value there. In fact, not just something of worth, but he saw unsurpassable worth. And we know that because he paid an unsurpassable price to get us free. He enters in and, and takes our place, and he's delivered over to the principalities and powers and suffers a God-forsaken death on the cross, apolutrosis, to set us free, to set us free. He redeems us by his own blood. He stood in our place. And now we have been freed, brought from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light, forgiven and reconciled. 
made right with God. That's what Jesus Christ does for us. I, I, I get a picture of this as I was uh, preparing this message and, and praying. I feel like the Lord gave me a, 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 a personal vision of this where I, I saw myself up on the auctioning table. And I was in chains and I was filthy. I, I was naked and ashamed. I was battered and bruised. And I'm on this auctioning table in, in this picture that I got. And uh, there's, it, it's, it, the auction table's in, 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 a market, in the middle of a marketplace and the marketplace is in hell. Because that really expresses the dire situation that we were in before we were, were redeemed. And there's these demonic creatures that it represents in my mind all around me. And they start doing the bidding. Although they're not really bidding. It's more of a game because they already own me. It, 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 they start to mock me. And they say things like, like, like uh, uh, you're, you're, you're a worthless nothing. You're, 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 no one would want you. No one would buy you. You're not even worth a nickel. You know, and and there's mocking, harsh, abusive voices. And I, there's nothing I can do. I'm trapped. I'm there. And there's this... Abuse coming at me. And then in the midst of the mocking voices, I hear another voice. And as soon as he starts to speak, everyone's quiet. Because this is the voice of the creator. This is the voice of my maker. This is the voice of my savior. And when he speaks, everyone else gets quiet. It's, in, in this picture I have, it's more of bewilderment. Like, why, why would you want anything to do with that slave? That worthless piece of meat. And then Jesus kind of works his way through the demonic crowd and He's over here to my left in this vision that I have, and, and he says, uh, I will pay, I, I want that slave, and I'll pay any price to get him, because that slave is my son, that slave is my beloved. The words cannot express uh, what, what this person, what Greg is worth to me. Uh, there's no way of, to measure the value that I find in Greg. The universe could not contain the love I have for Greg, and so I will pay any price to get him and to be with him and to get him out of this hell and to live forever with him. Whatever price it takes, I will give myself. Yeah. The minute he says, I will give myself, this demonic crowd in unison says, done, it's a deal. And then the mob attacks him and they, they start to pulverize him and beat him and spit him, kick him and, and abuse him in, 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 in terrible ways. And, and uh, they put him in chains. And then eventually they, they kill him. It's very much like the scene in uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, where, the, where Aslan is being just abused by these demonic creatures. It looks just like that. But I noticed that as they put the chains on him, with every chain that goes around him, a chain on me comes off. And I noticed that, that as they beat him and there's blood and bruises, as he does that, the bruises on me begin to disappear and the blood begins to disappear. And the more disfigured he becomes because of their abusive activity, he's just getting he, 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 to the point where he doesn't even look human. He's being just beaten to, to, to a piece of raw meat, just beaten. And the more disfigured he becomes, the more transformed I, 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 I see I'm becoming. And I'm becoming radiant. And I'm being fit for the kingdom of God. And see, this is exactly what Jesus Christ does for us. By standing in our place, by standing in our place, the manifestation of that love in that sacrifice where he becomes disfigured uh, defeats the powers of darkness for all who will accept it. And the chains come off and the blood goes away and we begin to be transformed into, into his likeness. He takes on our ugliness so we might take on his beauty. So that we, for, for, throughout all eternity, John says, we'll see him as he is for we shall be like him. He's transforming us, praise God, into that direction. It's because he sees, even in the, amen, even in the midst of the, uncertain, of, of the filth and the sin and the bondage, even while we're still there and we're still enjoying it, even there he sees something of worth. In fact, he sees unsurpassable worth. He sees his own image. He thinks we're worth dying for. He ascribes unsurpassable worth to us. And so we got to know whenever in our minds there's that residual effect of the kingdom of darkness. We've come out of the kingdom of darkness, we said last week, but not all the darkness has come out of us. And, 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 and so when we have those, that residual lingering uh, effect of the kingdom of darkness, those thoughts and those words which in various ways communicate, you're not worth anything, no one would want you, no one would pay any price for you, no, you're not, no one would ever sacrifice for you, whatever that looks like, you just got to remember Calvary. You got to remember Calvary, where your maker, who alone knows you, he knows what you're worth, he made you. Your maker, your creator says to you, 
You have unsurpassable worth. You could not be more loved than you are. In the midst of everything, before we get cleaned up, while we're still in bondage, he sees that worth. He sees that value. He's got that eternal love, that unwavering love. And that's why he says, I will pay whatever it takes. Whatever needs to be done, I will do it in order to get you to be living at my address, living in me forever and ever and ever. He paid the price. It's not that he had to pay off the father to stop being angry. Some people construe it like that. But no, he he didn't do that. It's not that he had to make a deal or bargain with the devil. It just means, redemption just means, apocalyptropsis means he would do whatever it took. He just did whatever it took uh, to free us. And what it took was everything. And that's what he was willing to pay. So the reality is we've been transported, all who accepted, have been transported from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of the sun. Our address has changed, as we said last week, from 666 Darkness Dominion Lane to 777 In Christ Boulevard that goes on forever and ever. Our address has changed. Amen. That's, in a metaphysical way, that's what's really happened. And now that we're at this address, there's a lot of things that are, that, that are, that are predestined for us. Uh, we're, at this address, there's nothing but blessing. Over here, there's nothing but, but a, a cloud of wrath. But now that we've changed addresses, here the sun shines, and so the holiness shines, and the love shines, and the grace shines. The forgiveness rains down upon us because we're in that address, and that address, as we saw last week, is Jesus Christ. That's what is true. But the challenge is, and this is the challenge that we have all of our life. This is, this is discipleship. The challenge is to really, really believe that. To believe it not just intellectually as an idea, but to let it get into the deepest corners of our psyche, to let it permeate our being, to let it become a core conviction where we really know that. And where that truth, the truth of who we are over there, has more authority than any other voice in our head. Because there's a lot of voices in our head. Got more authority. In fact, the goal is to make that, that truth, the truth of what... God says it's true, the truth of our location in Christ, the truth of our true being in Christ, that give us so much authority that nothing else is is ever heard. Or the minute it pops up, it's a silly thought. We just dismiss it. No longer being living under the bondage of things done in the past and things said in the past and things that events happened, all those messages that we we, we, we internalized and pollute our brain from the conditioning of the world. No, to give Christ so much authority that he's... The light just pushes out all darkness. That's the goal. But that's also the challenge. That's also the challenge, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Look what Paul says in Galatians 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And on one hand, I almost want to say, well, duh. Uh, Why else would Christ set you free? I mean, isn't that kind of a tautology? For freedom, Christ has set you free. No, I thought it was for bondage. No, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. But Paul has to say that because the Galatians were forgetting that. So he says, stand firm then. Stand firm, stand fast. And do not let yourself be burdened again by your yoke of slavery. You have been set free. That's what is true. But you you have to stand fast in that. And now you're brought back to this yoke of bondage, this yoke of slavery. Now the particular slavery that the Galatians were tempted by, and isn't that odd that we're tempted by slavery, but it's true. Because that's what we're used to. We're, we, we, you know, that's, a, that's a pattern of our thought. But the particular form of slavery they, they were tempted by was, was, was legalism. To base your relationship with God on how well you're doing at any given moment. Certain rituals, certain activities. And there may be some who are listening to this message right now for whom that is your temptation. Because those of us who come out of legalistic backgrounds can say, tell you this, as hard as they are, there's a certain security there. I get to control it. I know that if I just do A, B, and C, I'm good. And, and, and uh, I don't have to have this, this complete trust in the grace, uh, gr- grace of Jesus Christ. But see, that is bondage in its own way. And they were tempted by that. But this principle applies to every form of bondage we might ever think about. And, and it can be a little bit different for every one of us. They were tempted to go back into this bondage. They were set free, but the temptation was there. They had come out of darkness, but not all the darkness had come out of them. And now they were going back into it. And the reason that that happens is because God respects our personhood. God will not lobotomize us to instantly transform us. We might wish he would do that once in a while. Just come in and do a brain transplant or a heart transplant so that we instantaneously, inside and out, 
are, are boom, we're there. But God doesn't want to do that. No, that, that, that would make love disingenuous. There's got to be an element of choice and free will in this. So, so God empowers us to believe, uh, but we have to yield to that. And now God empowers us to live in accordance with this, the new citizenship that we've taken on the kingdom of God. But he doesn't make us do that. He doesn't do it all for us. He sets us free. We have to choose to stand fast in that. And that's what discipleship is all about. We have to choose to be transformed by that. Now, we can't do that without the empowering of the Holy Spirit. But even with the Holy Spirit empowering us, we ourselves have to choose this. He doesn't do it all for us. He created us to have dominion, right? He created us. This is the goal of everything. To reflect his character on earth as it is in heaven. And reflect his will on earth as it is in heaven. He wants a bride who's got say-so. Not a Stepford wife bride. He wants a bride who chooses him and chooses to carry out his will on earth as it is in heaven. Who has authority to co-rule. The Bible says that. And so what he wants is he empowers us to take back that co-ruling capacity. Which would be totally defeated if he did it all for us. No, he, he wants us to take back. He, he empowers us. We couldn't do it without his, the Holy Spirit working in our life. But with the Holy Spirit working in our life, we still have to choose to do this. To take back what the enemy stole. To take back the authority that the enemy stole from us. To take back the liberty that the enemy stole from us. To take back the personhood that the enemy stole from us. To take back the dignity that the enemy stole from us. And in doing that, we're learning once again, finally, how to co-rule. How to have authority. How to have say-so and line it up with uh, the, the will of God. He will not, he does not uh, lobotomize us. Amen. He has set us free. Our job is to stand fast in that freedom. Our job is to live and think consistent with that freedom. So it looks like this. I just saw some ice. How's that? First rule of public speaking. Make sure that you don't put objects in your mouth while you're talking. I, 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 I flunked that class. So it looks like this. The reality is, so if, if, follow me on this. And the Holy Spirit just land right here. We have been brought out of this kingdom of darkness where we were, we were impoverished spiritually. And we've been brought into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his dear son, and now Paul says in Ephesians 1 that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. We are unthinkably rich over in this realm. Every spiritual blessing has been given to us because we're here in this address and we're in the sun. And so, so the reality is that we are rich uh, in, 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 in everything that pertains to the kingdom of God. We've inherited the, the kingdom of God. In that sense, we own the kingdom of God right here and right now, not just when you die in the by and by, but right here, right now. You are rich in God's love, packed with God's love. You are rich in God's grace. You're packed with God's grace. You're rich in God's confidence. You're packed with God's confidence. You're, 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 you're rich in, in, in the ability to forgive, and you're rich in the, the ability to walk in the power of his love. You're, you're, you're just packed with that. That's what's true about you. That's the reality. But how often, how often we, we, we live as though, as, as though that wasn't true? How often we, we live as though we're impoverished? Uh, oh, you know, I, I've only got a, a, a penny of worth. I've only got a crumb of forgiveness. I've only got, you know, an ounce of, of, of confidence. I don't have any patience. I, we live as though that was true. See, what God is saying to us this morning is freedom. Freedom! Yeah. Like Braveheart freedom, I'm talking. Freedom! I, I wanted to show that clip, but, but uh, it was a little too graphic. Uh, but that, that God's saying, for freedom, I've set you free. Stand fast in that freedom. I, 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 I've, I've made you rich in the heavenly realm. So live, live rich. Think rich. Have rich attitudes. Manifest that rich, rich, richness. I'm not talking about finances here because that's not promised us in the gospel. Some people apply it that way. But what is promised to us through the gospel makes that, that irrelevant. I don't care how poor you are. You maybe don't have a dime to your name. You are rich. I'm telling you, you are rich. And God's saying, stand fast in the richness so that you're full of his love. You've got an infinite reservoir of the Spirit flowing through you. You're rich in his grace. Manifest that. Think that. Live that. Oh, old patterns die hard, don't they? Oh, old patterns of thought. You ever notice this? I mean, it's, your situation can totally change. And yet, we keep thinking like the old situation. This is what the Israelites were, were all about. They get out of Egypt. They're set free. They're no longer slaves. But you'd never know it by the way they talk in the wilderness. Oh, well, they're cool as long as everything's going well. And, you know, Yahweh's up there doing his miracles. But as soon as there's any trouble, they're like, run away. Go back to Egypt. It was nice in Egypt. We liked Egypt. Egypt was fun. <laughs> Reality is, Egypt was miserable. 
Being a slave under Pharaoh would be miserable. But see, that's what they were used to. Four centuries of living in that condition is going to do something to your brain. And, 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 and they were comfortable with that. How often we, 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 we go back to thought patterns just because they're familiar. There's a comfort there. There's a security there. And maybe it's not very pleasant, but, but we're used to that. Whereas stepping in this new identity, I, yeah, I've never done it before. It feels weird. It feels like I'm pretending. It feels artificial. And so we run back to Egypt when, 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 when God has called us to, to live in freedom. Oh, thought patterns can sometimes die very hard, even with the empowering of the Holy Spirit. My stepmother, God bless her, I know I use my stepmother a lot in a lot of illustrations. And, and I want you to know that, that after she divorced my dad and, and they, they split apart, and, um, she turned into a real wonderful lady. I mean, she got saved and, and her character was transformed and she was just a delight. And, and I, I'll see her in heaven. So she was a wonderful lady. I don't mean to trash her. But in the years that I was being raised, it wasn't so lovely. And that's why she makes for a lot of good sermon illustrations. <laughs> So here's the thing, she came through the Great Depression. She, you know, she went through that Great Depression. So did my dad. And they both lived in very poor circumstances. I mean, they talked about how they had to eat beans. Their family ate beans for an entire year one time because it's the only, somehow they got a shipment of beans and they, they ate it for a year. I mean, it was really bad. And they, but it did something to both of them, but especially to my stepmother. And it, the way it affected them was the opposite. It was really weird. My dad had this mindset of, of uh, look at it, we, we, may, we might not have money tomorrow, so let's spend it now. <laughs> you know, we can afford stuff, let's enjoy it now, because tomorrow it might, it might go. My stepmother had the same you know, concern about money leaving tomorrow, but she had the opposite conclusion. Since we might not have money tomorrow, we better save it uh, now and not buy anything. And they had some interesting discussions uh, surrounding finances. It was... It was actually absolute warfare. It was, they, they would have these fights because my dad wanted to buy this and my stepmother was saying, no, we, 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 we might not have any money tomorrow. That's exactly why we should buy the boat. We might not be able to do it tomorrow. So get it now. Let's have fun now. And they'd have these incredible fights. And my dad, who, when he got angry, was just the world's best truck driver poet because uh, he, he could instantly spin out the, the uh, entire paragraphs without a single clean word. It was ingenious. It was, so he would say in various ways, blankety blank, blank, blank. You're not in the blankety blank depression any longer. That's done. Do you, do you ever read the post-it note? The depression is over. And he, would, he always would be saying that. We're not in the depression anymore. Why do you keep thinking like we're in the depression? We can afford this. Let's get this. And they, he was too far in the other extreme. My stepmother just had this, I mean, being frugal is one thing. But she was, she, was, she was compulsive. She was a miser, a hoarder. She just, everything, you would, you would think that we were dirt poor by the way she lived. And we weren't very rich, but we could afford some things. Like clothes once in a while, that would have been nice. <laughs> All the clothes we had, she would ask neighbors when their sons got, you know, outgrew their clothes, could I have those clothes? As though we had to beg for that. So we always got hand-me-downs. In fact, only the, only the oldest kids usually got the clothes that was bought for them. And even that was from Goodwill. And by the time they got it, it was, it was already two years out of date. And then I had to get the hand-me-downs from him, my older brother. So by the time I got it, it was like five years out of date. And you know how important being stylish is in seventh grade? I mean, this is not a good thing. But, uh, but and it was unnecessary. We could have got some new clothes, but we never did. All hand-me-downs. Now I'm on a hand-me-up program because I got a son-in-law who works for this good clothing store, and I get, I get their, I'm only one year out of date because I get their inventory for free, so hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I like that now. <laughs> Didn't like it back then. No, but see, she had come out of the, 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 the Great Depression, but the Depression hadn't come out of her. She would ration everything. I'm not kidding. Everything had to be rationed. She, at one point, for about a year, was convinced that we were using more toilet paper than was necessary. And so she would ration toilet paper. I'm not kidding. Um, and so when we had to go to the bathroom, we had to go to her and say, Mom, I got to go to the bathroom. And then she would give us the, the allotment of toilet paper. And for girls, if it was a number one, do you guys still use number one, number two language? Is that still time? Do you have to go number one or number two? Okay. Well, if you had to go number one, for the girls, guys didn't get anything, but for the girls, you got one slice, a little, little square. If you had to go number two, we got four slices. And four slices is very adequate for a number two if you're on a high fiber diet. <laughs> Which we weren't. I know. And, and so sometimes, sometimes, and if you complained, what you got was her story about 
When I was a kid, we used corn cobs and Sears catalogs in an outhouse. You ought to be grateful. <laughs> and we liked it that way. Uh, see, patterns of thought don't change overnight. But this is exactly the situation that we're in. We've been brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the sun. But you, sometimes we never know it by looking at our life. We're rich with spiritual blessings, every spiritual blessing. But sometimes you'd never know it by looking at our life, by, by looking at the way that we think. We're, we're, we're out of Egypt, but we keep thinking like we're in Egypt. And that's why, to that degree, the kingdom is manifested in our life. Jesus Christ rescued us from bondage and made us free. He has freed us. We're in the land of freedom. To be under the reign of Christ is to be free. That's what's true here. You are right now. If you've accepted Christ and put your trust in Christ and have pledged your life to Christ, you are free. You are 100% free. The truth is... That sin doesn't have a claim on you any longer. You're not bound by sin any longer. The truth is that you're not bound to Satan and the powers any longer. The truth is that there's nothing that can hold you down. You are free. You've been liberated, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. That's the truth. But oh, how sometimes, let's, let's admit it, you never know that that's true by the way that we think and the way that we talk and the way that we live. We give our thoughts, fallen thoughts and experiences more authority than the truth in Christ. And therein lies the problem. You have people who, and we all do this to some degree, we sincerely think that we can't help it. We sincerely think that this is just who we are. You know, I, 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 of course I'm angry. My, my dad was always angry, and that's how I was raised, and, and, and the genes are, are, are screwing me up, and I, I just can't help it. This is who I am. This, I just got to live with myself. And there's a degree to which we have to kind of realize that this is a process and, and you can't change everything overnight. And there's a degree that we need to ac accept where we are. But when we use that kind of defeatist thinking, it's Egypt thought. It's Egypt talk. It's Egypt living. I can't help it. I, I, I'm just an anxious person. That's just who I am. I'm just a worry ward. I'm just fearful. I just don't have any confidence. I just can't do that. In bondage, bondage, we inherit a world that binds us. And see, God this morning is saying to us, like William Wallace on Braveheart, freedom! 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 Stand fast in the freedom for which I've set you free because that's why I set you free, is that you'd live in it. Walk in the freedom. I've set you free, so think free, act free, live free, be free. When the sun sets free is free indeed. Live in that, think that, internalize that, manifest that, speak that. You know, people, people do almost anything for, for, for just earthly freedom. To be free of, of someone else's authority, to not be in a, in, a, in a totalitarian state. People die for freedom, earthly freedom. Well, if that's true for earthly freedom, how much more intentional we must be to live in, and stand fast in the freedom for which Christ died. This is the all-important thing. This is everything. Stand fast in the freedom for which he set you free. So I want to I close with, with two things, two things very quickly. The first is an exercise. In fact, it's going to be an assignment. Here it is. Holy Spirit, help us to be honest with ourselves and bring to the surface what needs to be brought to the surface right here and right now. I want you to right now, I mean, before you run a marathon, you've got to be take, able to take a baby step. So I want to do a baby step here. I want you to think of one thing, just, just one, one thing in, in your life that is a residual effect of the kingdom of darkness. Uh, a lingering thought, a lingering habit, uh, some aspect of your life that is yet bondage. Or at least it doesn't manifest the full freedom that you have in Christ. Right now, think about that. And just let, let the Holy Spirit give you one thing. It, it could be an anger issue. It could be a habit. It could be, it could be lust. It could be, you know, fear. I don't know. Whatever it is. Just one thing. Okay, now, lock that in. That's part of your, what you've inherited from this world. That's part of Egypt. That's the realm of darkness, a lingering residue effect there. Now I want you to imagine yourself without that. You're free of that. And so you've got to realize that you're not making your, that up when you see that self that is free of that bondage. This isn't pop psychology. We're not trying to just imagine, you know, a make-believe kind of thing. What's make-believe is you think you're not that. that you're making that up. Because what's true is this you that is without that bondage. And so see that you that is free. Imagine that. This is what faith is all about. Faith is, is envisioning a future in line with God's will and believing it is so, having this conviction that it is so. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's a substantial, concrete envisionment of a future 
which creates a, a, a conviction that it is so. And that, that's, that vision is what pulls you in that direction. That's how vision always works. That's how faith always works. So you're having faith. And so as you see yourself free of this bondage, say, it is so. That is so. That is the true me. And then envision that self right here, right now. Holy Spirit, help us. In, in the situation where you're most inclined to manifest the bondage, the deceptive bondage self, that lie. Uh, and now put yourself in that situation. See it as concretely as you can or however you do imagination. Close your eyes if you need to. And see yourself in that situation, but now you're not angry. You always have been before, but see, envision yourself not angry. And envision yourself at peace. Whatever, whatever freedom looks like for you in that situation, see it. You're having faith. And say, it is so. It is so. Mm. And then let's ask the Holy Spirit to lock this in. Now, I, I, the assignment is this. I want you to do this every day for the next week. In fact, I encourage you to do it first thing in the morning, every day this week. In fact, I encourage you to do it before you get out of bed, if you can remember it. But I know people are always are different like that. Some of us wake up, and that's my you know, most brain active time. Other people take about three cups of coffee before the brain gets activated. I got that. So, so however it works for you, but, but as soon as you're, you have consciousness that can do this, envision who you really are and say, it is so. And then I, I want you to practice this 10 times at least per day. See, it takes intentionality to change old thoughts. Inten we've got to be very intentional about this. This is discipleship. God wants us to take back you know, the, the, what, what the enemy stole. He wants us to eventually co-rule co -rule with him over this entire earth. But first, we've got to take back the plot of land between our ears. And this is what it looks like, seeing yourself as you truly are in Christ. Practice this 10 times a day and say it is so and speak that. Now, you'll have a feeling like you're making it up, like this is make-believe, that could never be. But see, it only, only feels that way because it's not familiar. You're familiar with that old angry self or the lusting self or the bondage self or the lacking confidence. That's what's familiar. That's your Egypt. But you've got to go into new, new areas. And so you, let's take one area and hammer it home. And watch how that begins to affect change. In fact, as you're doing this, look for opportunities, and they'll come around, opportunities to step into this self. And when, when, when you realize that you're starting to get angry, if that's the issue you're choosing, or, or lacking there, remember who you really are, envision that, say it is so, and then step into it. I'm going to try this new self on. Because this is your true self. And you start walking in the light. Okay, will you do that? That's assignment. Will you do that? We'll say amen if you're going to do that. Yeah. All right, ten times a day at least. Secondly, stand up. We've got to close this thing. I want, to make a, I want us to end with a proclamation. There's a power in words, folks. When we say stuff, I mean, this is part of our say-so here. Uh, our words have power. It locks stuff in. It changes reality. So we're going to have a proclamation of freedom, okay? Let's have a proclamation of freedom. And so I, I'm just going to say uh, some words, and you repeat after me, but I want you to repeat it with, with conviction. It doesn't matter how much your life doesn't line up with what we're going to proclaim right now. Uh, because all of us have re residual effects from Egypt. Uh, and and it, you've got to realize that that flows out of, out of the bondage self. We're going to say what is true here. So don't go evaluating your life in this. The enemy will try to get you to do that, to bring condemnation. But no, we're going to say what is true according to God's word and according to our identity in uh, the, the kingdom of light. So repeat after me, but repeat it with conviction. All right? On the authority of Jesus Christ. This is not a liturgy, you guys. No, I, you guys, you, you, you're freed, okay? You just got off the, the, the auction block, all right? You, you just got out of the marketplace of hell, and now you're in the kingdom of light. Okay, let's say it like that was true, because it is true. By the authority of Jesus Christ, By the of Jesus Christ we, declare we declare that we are redeemed. We are, redeemed. We are, set, free. We are set free. We've been brought out of the kingdom of, darkness, the kingdom of darkness and brought into, brought into the kingdom of the sun. On the authority of Jesus Christ, we declare that we are slaves no longer, that all chains are broken, the power of sin has been defeated, bondage to Satan has ended, and the authority of Jesus Christ, we proclaim that we will stand fast in this freedom. We will stand fast. In our, in our inheritance, and we will not return, we will not return 
to a yoke of bondage. And on the authority of Jesus Christ, we renounce all bondage to fear, to insecurities, to greed, to despair. We renounce all bondage to sexual addiction, to drug addiction, to people-pleasing addiction. And we renounce all bondage to self-centeredness, to the idols of this culture and to anything else that could possibly enslave us. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And we are free! Hallelujah! Yes! yes. Amen! Freedom! 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 Yes! 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 We're redeemed! We're out of Egypt! Got a new identity in Christ Jesus. I implore you to take seriously being intentional about what's going on in your brain and to choose to be transformed by the renewing of your mind and no longer according to the patterns of Egypt, the fallen world. Amen. I'm going to ask the prayer teams to come forward. And if you're here this morning have any need whatsoever uh, that you'd like to have prayed for, I encourage you to come forward and pray with these folks. You can share anything. It's in confidence. It'll be, they'll go to the grave with it. You don't have to worry about that. I encourage you to do that also during the worship service, you guys. We've got prayer warriors all around the auditorium. Take advantage of that. But right now, you're invited to come forward and pray. Otherwise, I just implore you to go out and know who you are and think who you are and live as you are and love as, according to as you are and give grace and forgiveness and mercy according to your true identity as a citizen of the kingdom of light. In Jesus' name, Godspeed.